Thank you, church. Woo! Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Man, it's, uh, hey, you know what we ought to do before we go any further? We really ought to thank all of our volunteers and staff that have worked so hard. Now, you know, you walk in, you see a few things in the atrium, and you're like, well, how much? I think about a wedding. Have you ever been to a wedding, and you're like, they come in, they say, I do, and you're like, you just spent a whole year of your life planning that, right? Okay, well, that's sort of the way it is. Behind the scenes, there are so many moving parts and pieces. People have been working really some for literally months to put together what you're going to experience over the next three weeks. So can we celebrate that and thank them for all that they've done? A lot of work. A lot of work. And it's going to be a great time. As we've said, a lot of people are going to come to faith in Christ. And this is a great time for me really to rally the truth. So what we're going to do, you know, we spend a lot of time here talking about introducing our friends. That's part of our mission statement right up front. Introduce our friends to Jesus. So we're all about that. The second part is learning to follow him, and I want to focus in this one week before we really get going and focus on introducing our friends to Jesus for three weeks, I want to just sort of talk to the church. Now, if you're not, if you're not a believer or maybe you're here for the very first time, there will definitely be takeaway in this message, but every once in a while I just need to say, hey church, I want to talk to you, and what I want to talk to all of us about is how to let your light shine. Jesus made this amazing statement when you just think about it. He said that you and I, you are, own this for yourself, you are the light of the world. And then he went on to say that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And what he was talking about is in Israel, even still today, you can see these hilltop towns. They're called tells. They're like archaeological areas. Many of the cities that you see mentioned in the Old Testament, they were on like this hilltop. And Jesus was saying, you can't hide that kind of uh, an experience. A city like that can't be hidden. He went on to say, nor do people light a lamp and put a basket over it, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. He said, in the same way, let your light shine so that others can see your good works and they'll give glory to your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. He didn't say you could be. He didn't say work for it. It's because Jesus said that he was the light of the world. And when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, then suddenly you have that light inside of you. And if you have Christ in you, you shouldn't be able to hide that. It's, it, you can see that from miles. And when people lit up their homes, they put that oil lamp he was talking about in their home. They light that up all over. You're going to see that city from miles and miles away. And people ought to be able to see us, and they see Christ in us. And I want you to own the fact that you are the light of the world. Why? Because you have a hope inside of you. You have a peace that other people don't have. You have answers. You have comfort. You have a connection with God Almighty. And you have a future hope in heaven. And that gives so much hope. And I think we forget how dark it is for some people how, how it, it, we've been a Christian for a while, and we forget what it's like to be out in the dark. When my wife and I lived out in Wyoming, one of the things that kind of blew my mind, I worked in the oil field, and so I'd find myself in some kind of a truck or vehicle driving through Wyoming in the middle of the night. That state doesn't have many people in it. I think even now the population is only like 400,000 people. And it is a larger state geographically than North Carolina. Can you imagine that? You could be driving along at night on a gravel road. It's like a big gravel road, so it's like almost like an interstate gravel road. You're out in the middle of nowhere, and you can drive for really hours. You would think this is impossible. No, there are places where there's nothing. And you're in the dark at night. Your fuel is running out. And you're, this was back before cell phones, so you, you, you're like lost, and you're not sure that last turn was right. And you're going on, and then it starts snowing, and you feel like a blizzard is coming on. And there is such a sense of fear and desperation and lostness and aloneness. When you see one light, it doesn't matter what it might be. It might be a home, it might be a ranch, it might be a little place to buy some fuel, it might have a phone. That one light, it might just anchor you and you say, oh yeah, I know where that place is. That one light gives you so much hope. And I think after you've been a Jesus follower for a while... We forget how dark the world is. After a service a couple of weeks ago, one of our volunteers came up to me, and he, he brought this young man with him, about 20 years old. He said, I want to introduce you to this guy. 
And he was hoping that he would tell me his story. And he warmed up in, to me, and he did. Come to find out, he had been sitting at home contemplating that this would be the day that he would commit suicide. But because one of you invited him, instead, instead of committing suicide, he said, I will go to the Cove Church. And while he was here, he heard the message of Jesus Christ, and he prayed to receive Christ. This is where you guys get excited, right? His life has changed, and he wanted me to know that this church, God using this church, saved his life. Now, it might surprise you to know that's not an unusual story for the Cove Church. Once or twice a year, someone will come up and tell me that same story. I was planning to commit suicide, but instead, I remembered how someone here, one of you, invited me, and so they went to the Cove Church instead of suicide that day, that night, that morning, and they came to faith in Jesus Christ. And God saved not only their physical life, but their spiritual life. We forget where people are at. Do you remember the last time you faced a struggle that brought you to your knees? Many people don't realize there's help. They never go to their knees. They don't know to do that. They're struggling alone in the dark. Do you remember the last time that you called a friend and asked them to pray for you? And you told them what was going on in your life. Your unbelieving friend doesn't have that resource. And so Jesus doesn't say you, you can be the light. He says you are the light. You have light in you. Now, how does that work? How do, you, how do people see that light? He said let them see it through your good works. And I love that because that good work, that phrase, it can mean almost anything. When people notice your kindness, they're seeing that light shine. That's your good work. When they see your smile in difficult situations, when they hear you apologize when you're wrong, they notice that. When they remember that you stopped to give them help when no one else did, or that their kids want to be at your home after school because of the way you treat your children. Why? Because Why do they want to be there? Because you're the light. And so what I'm asking you to do is be glow-in-the-dark Christians. And I want to talk about how to be intentionally shining that light. Because what God does, he takes all of those little acts, those little glimpses of light, and he empowers them and puts the message of Jesus Christ together with the power of the Holy Spirit, and people's lives are changed. And I, and I see it all the time. You guys are letting your light shine. So many of you are doing that already and I just want to call that out some of you a, a number of you foster or foster parents you're letting your light shine several of you have started your own ministries where you're taking care of the homeless in your area many of you go to prisons and you share Jesus and some of you have taken care of widows and just help them get established and get their feet on the ground many of you donate cars to the church and just so you know whenever a car is donated to the church we don't sell that. We make sure that it gets into the hands of a young family or maybe a single parent who needs a ride. Many of you give your clothes, not just the bad, ugly ones, but the really good clothes because you know it goes to a young mother who needs to go to a job interview because she's trying to get her life straightened out. And so many of you do so many things. Like perhaps you pay for the groceries ahead of you in line or the person behind you in the drive through And God says, I want you to learn to let your light shine. Now, church, I want to take you to Matthew in chapter 10, because in this chapter, Jesus shows us how to reach people for Christ and how to let that light really shine and per penetrate into people's lives. And he sends out his 12 disciples, and he tells them how to reach people for Christ. He called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over, I want you to write that word down if you're taking notes, highlight it if you're on your electronic Bible, authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And in the same way, you and I have been empowered. You and I have been given authority. Jesus is saying, I'm turning you guys loose. I'm going to give you a trial run while I'm still here. And he sent his 12 out. And he was saying, you are my strategy for winning the world. One day, I'm going to be leaving. I'm going to leave you in charge to do it. Later, just before Jesus' death on earth, 
it, and when he went back to heaven after his death on earth, his resurrection, he said, he came to his disciples and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Now that lands on every one of us. And again, Jesus uses that word authority. He says, I'm leaving you here. You are my strategy and you are sent out and you are empowered. He gave his disciples special power. Now, you may be thinking right now, man, I don't have that kind of power. I can't bring anybody back from the dead like that. What are you talking about, Mike? You're going crazy on me. I can't cast out a demon. I would run. I, you don't know how much power you have until you've tried to use it. Can I ask you, have you ever tried to pray in a situation that was desperate? You were under pressure? When I was in seminary, when I was in graduate school, I had a job at a mall as a security guard. Yes, I was a mall cop. And I got to tell you, it was one of my favorite jobs, man. It was just so awesome. And I, I won't go into all that, but it was really a great job. You kind of got to experience all kinds of things, every kind of person and kook that you could imagine. So one night, right after the mall closes at 9, this is about 9.15 or so, right after the mall closed, but there's still people around it. I had gone back to the center of the mall where sometimes we would sort of rendezvous up with the other security guards waiting on them to come. And this guy comes at me. He's big. He's all muscled up. Looks like a bodybuilder. And he's crazy. Now, can I just tell you, big muscles and crazy does not, you don't want all that in one package. You know what I mean? That's kind of a scary thing. And he was, he was looking at me. I had never seen this guy before. But he's focused on me. And he's, he's telling me, I'm going to kill you. I, it, you don't want to hear that either. You know what I mean? And I mean, I've got all I've got is a radio that I can throw at him, you know? And I know he's crazy, but I don't have time to counsel him. I, I don't have time to, you know, he's coming at me. He's saying, he's saying I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, he's just got his hands out. He's coming at me. And all I could do, I thought about this verse of scripture where Jesus says you have to bind the strong man. So I just put my hand out and I said, in the, and this is in front of people. There was a huge crowd. There were people around. I just said, in the name of Jesus, I bind you. That guy just, he just went like that. He couldn't move. He just, he just stood there and you could see the shock on his face. He, he, he couldn't move. I didn't know what to do either. So I'm just like, I don't know from here or what, you know. So I just, you know, what do you do? I just kind of wondered. Uh, back and, and then all of a sudden he just kind of turned and started he just walked off and we walked off from that situation listen you don't know how much power you have until you by faith you get in a situation and you try to use it now about a week later I saw this guy in the mall and I thought oh no here we go again you know hope that works but he came up to me and he wasn't crazy then and I asked him about you know what had happened, and we started talking about faith, and he was interested. We went off to a secluded place, and I led him to faith in Christ. And when he prayed to receive Jesus, he got so happy, he started jumping around. He started skipping, and it wasn't just a momentary, passionate thing. I checked on him over time. He got involved in his church. He so much completely got saved and came to faith in Jesus Christ. And you may not think that you have that power, but you do. Jesus didn't just give it to the disciples. They weren't like superheroes. They weren't like the Avengers. Well, I don't know if you ever thought about that, but who would Peter be? I think Peter would be Spider-Man, right? But, but, but that's not how God works. Those were normal, everyday people. James and John were called the sons of thunder, and they were famous for arguing about who was the greatest. They even got their mom involved in that. She comes to Jesus and says, hey, give them some special seats next to you. How embarrassing is that? Matthew is a tax collector and a Roman collaborator. Thomas we call the doubter. And Peter denied that he even knew Jesus at one point and started cussing about it. So no matter who you are, you can see yourself in that group. And I want you to know God has given you power. Again, look at this. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, this is for all of us, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. You have power. But we need to use that power. One time, recently, I came off of the 4 o'clock uh, service. I had preached at 4 o'clock, and I felt like it was just, I, it didn't come off of the stage. I felt so bad about it. And as I was praying about it, God said, Mike, I gave you exactly what you asked for. And I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't pray before I went out there. I didn't ask for the Holy Spirit's power. I didn't ask for the Holy Spirit to be in this room. And so many times, God gives us exactly what we ask for because we're not asking for anything. 
You have incredible power. You may not feel like you have it, but God says you have it, so I'm going to go with God, not you. God's given you talents and potential and ability. And what Jesus is saying is don't hide what God's given you. Don't hide your light under a basket because it's going to shine. You would have to cover it to keep it from shining. Don't let fear cause you to talk you out of what God has put you up to do. I believe that this week, God's going to put you in a situation where your light can shine. Why? Because I've been praying that. I feel like God's been leading in that way. And so for every one of us, God's going to put you in a situation. It'll be in a way that, that is completely at peace with who you are. You might be an introvert or an extrovert. God uses both. And he's going to use you this week. Now, here's what Jesus said about how to reach people in this passage. I was promising you. Here's how he goes into it. He says, whatever town or village you enter, find out who's worthy. Luke, when he writes this down, he calls it the person of peace. And if it, it, um, it, find out who's worthy in it, in this home, and stay there until you depart. And as you enter the house or the home, greet it. And if the home or those who are in the home are worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. Jesus was talking about uh, earlier, he said, don't take a bunch of luggage with you, any luggage or a bunch of clothes or any money. But rely on the goodness of strangers, rely on hospitality, and rely on God to connect you. And look for what Luke calls more concisely this person of peace, a man of peace, or a woman of peace. And we've learned from this. We do this whenever we go into a missionary situation. We went into Honduras. The man of peace was Pastor Israel. It's a person who is receptive to what you want to do. They have the gift of hospitality. They have influence. And God uses them in a great way. And we've learned to do that. In, in Egypt, it was Sammy, that, who is now on staff here. We call him Sammy the Egyptian. Now, he really is our man of peace that goes out whenever we go out on mission trips. And what I'm saying, and we usually think of it from that angle, but what I'm saying, what I'm asking you this weekend is that you would consider being that person of peace, that person of passport. This is being really extremely intentional about introducing your friends to Jesus. Plan and look for the opportunities. Be the one who is the door opener and look for people who are open. Now, once you see this person of peace, this idea that's in the Bible, you can see it all over the place. Zacchaeus was a man of peace. After he came to faith in Christ, he comes down out of that tree, he asks Christ into your li his life, he receives him. The first thing he does is go home and throw a big party. He invites all the tax collectors. And Matthew is a tax collector also. The same thing happens with him. Jesus goes along, sees him in his booth, says, come follow me, and Matthew does. The first thing he does is throw a big party. And he invites all of his tax collector friends and a bunch of notorious sinners, packs out the house. And Jesus is able to reach them. You see it again and again. The Samaritan woman who is by a well who comes to faith in Christ just outside of this little town. She goes back into town. She has so much influence and passport with people. She's able to turn the whole town out. They come back out. And many people, the whole town comes to faith in Christ. Cornelius, the same situation. He has a dream. He sends for Peter. Peter comes to his house. It's packed out full when he gets there, full of Cornelius' friends. Everyone that was there came to faith in Jesus Christ. And you can see it again, Lydia and on and on. So church, here's the challenge. Be a man of peace. Be a woman of peace. Student, be a person of the student of peace. You can see this even with students. And I, I can see growing up, students' homes where they were that person. They would connect. They would bring people in that were Christians, but also they would bring into their home people that weren't, and their parents would have a huge influence on these kids. Every one of us can be that person. Use your influence, your popularity, your personality, your home, your yard, your pool, your, your garage, your, your workshop, your, your, your lawnmower, whatever you have, use it to connect people and to be that person to say, you know what, maybe you feel like I might be right now too shy to go all into how to get saved, but I can open up the opportunity. 
I, you throw, some of you can throw a party. You're great at that. Invite some people from your life group also to that party. Or maybe you would never, you don't even want to go to a party, but you can fix anything. Be who you are, but let your light shine. I'm not saying do anything that's foreign to you. Just let your, take the basket off and be intentional about sharing Jesus with your friends. Invite them into your home. Include your, some life group people. Pray about it. God, open doors here. God, I'm going to do what I can do. Then I'm going to ask you to do what only you can do. And then, you know, while you're just helping your neighbor out, maybe repairing their dryer, or you're just watching them as they do some drywall work, ask them what they're doing this weekend. And try to connect people. Hey, would you like to go to church? Uh, maybe, I, and this is why it's great to have a, the Saturday night service. You can tell people, hey, this Saturday night, why don't we go out? They're like, okay, hey, what do you want to do? I would love to go out to dinner, but what if we went to church first? You know, instead of a movie or they're going to all the way into Charlotte to a play, let's go to church. It'll only take about an hour, and then we'll go out. There's plenty of time to do that on a Saturday night. Now think about it. Who else is going to reach your friends? You're the only person as weird as they are. That's why you're in that group. You're, you have the passport to reach them. You have the influence within your group, and we all have a group. You may be thinking, well, you know, my house is small. I don't want to invite people over. You know, we, got, we don't have a lot of money. I love to tell people, you know what? Poor people need Jesus too. Is that, just, that was funny, okay? That's what I'm just saying. Lighten up, lighten up a little bit, you know? Or maybe you say, my house is messy, and I don't want dirty people need Jesus too, you know? Whatever, whatever, wherever you are, be who you are. My wife and I were in this home. Someone invited us over. This was years ago. You wouldn't know them, but you might be them in a way. <laughs> We, we came over to their house, and the husband wasn't there yet, and she was cooking spaghetti. I'll never forget this. had a big pot of spaghetti sauce, and I noticed her house was spotless. I don't mean spotless. I mean scary spotless, you know? And, and so I, we were sitting there, and the, the spaghetti was still boiling in that pot, and every time it would, a drop would come out, you know, kind of burp out, she would wipe it. The first time I didn't, you know, then the second time, then I realized, you know, burp, spoop, wipe, and it started getting spooky. You know what I mean? Because I started thinking, oh, we're in, a, this person is obsessive, you know? This is a, and every time she wiped, I got a little more nervous. I was like, oh, wait till I start eating. There's going to be spaghetti going everywhere, you know? And she's got, is she going to be around me doing that while I'm trying to eat? It, that's not what hospitality is. There is a gift in the Bible of hospitality. It's a spiritual gift. God takes something like that, he, let, it, it, he supercharges it with the Holy Spirit, and it turns into something that God can use. You just let your life shine, your light shine. So a person with a gift of hospitality, it's not that they have the perfect home, that can even get in the way of it. It's that they make people feel comfortable and welcome and loved in whatever situation it is. So open up your home, open up your life, and here's the thing, you'll be better off forehead because that's what God's put in your heart to be and to do and here's what we've done this is the this is the wisdom of movies at the cove we have set the stage three weeks out of the year some people like you know they don't get this whole movies at the cove thing hey you're not it's, I'd rather just be up there for 30 minutes of preaching you get that all the time okay and so we're going to take this three-week break and we have set this stage we like created this environment that makes it a slam dunk for you to invite people to. Because it's just crazy. It's just weird at one level. But listen, if they have kids, don't even invite the parents. Just invite the kids. And you tell them, sneak a few snapshots before you leave. And you show them what's going on. And the kids will come and they'll bring their, their parents. But what I'm saying is don't hide your faith. Don't hide your light under a basket. Now, you don't have to be preachy or opinionated or, you know, sometimes we're so stubborn. And all. Just be yourself and be happy and be positive. Be loving and inviting and welcoming. Maybe everyone in your office is angry and upset and complaining all the time, but you are totally different. You have a great idea, attitude. That is being a life. Be a thermostat, not a thermometer. A thermometer just tells you what the temperature is. That's easy to do. It's too cold. It's too hot. It's like it's just complaining. And there's a lot of people that think they're having an influence when they're just calling out the obvious. But instead, be a thermostat. A thermostat can actually change the temperature 
of an environment. And you don't do that by being argumentative. Don't try to be right all the time. That's really shining the light on you. Be respectful even when everyone else is being disrespectful. You know, it's easy to shine the light whenever we're all together worshiping, but it's much more difficult to shine the light in a dark place. And so be that light and do it consistently. People don't change over time, overnight. They change over time. So keep shining that light and be a friend to sinners like Jesus. That's one of the, it was really an insult to Jesus, but he was called the friend of sinners. And you have to overlook some flaws to do that. And love gives you the ability. I think about this verse of scripture that Rick Carney sent to me one time. It just stuck in my head. For light, Christ's love compels us. We're compelled to do all of this because we've experienced Jesus' love. And because of that, we want other people to experience it. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11 says, Since we know what it is to love the Lord, we try to persuade people. I want to persuade people to ask Jesus to come into their heart because of the love I've experienced from him. That makes me want to let my light shine. So all you have to do is just lean into your relationships and, and be attractive. You, you, don't, you don't have to try to be cool, though. I think we put too much pressure on ourselves. Just be you. And when it's time, invite them. Share your story and the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the result to God. And don't worry about being rejected. Jesus talked about this in this passage in Matthew chapter 10. He said, if they reject you, just shake the dust off of your feet. Now, that's not a thing that we do, but it was a thing that they would do if you're being rejected. It was just kind of a symbolic thing. And I think this is important. Sometimes we get so caught up and wrapped up in people's responses, and there's a danger in that. If you get your feelings hurt or you get embarrassed and you take it too hard when people say no or they think you're a, a, a nut for Jesus or whatever, it can turn you off from sharing with the next person. So what Jesus is saying is don't take it so hard, so personal, so serious, because you can't save anyone anyhow. They're not turning you down. This is between God and them. So learn to ride loose in the saddle and, and just roll with it. And sometimes I've learned, this is a difficult lesson. God's shown me in about three people, I finally got the concept. He was like, Mike, let it go. They, you've already done all you can do. They've turned you down. They've shut you off. In one case, cut you off. And so you need to let that go. I'm in charge of this, not you. You're not going to be the one that saves them anyhow. And I've got people. I've got resources. I can do this. And we need to learn to do what God puts us up to do, but not get so uptight about it that when we're rejected, we're crushed. Jesus went on to say in verse 19, when they deliver you over, he's talking about when you get arrested because there was persecution going on at the time. Don't be worried, anxious about what you're going to say or speak or what you're going to say, for you are to say what you're to say will be given to you in that hour because it's not you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you when they arrest you. Persecution will happen. And he said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. In this passage, he says that. So it's going to happen. It's not, it's not if, it's just when. It, it, and so he says, don't be anxious. Don't be worried about that. We worry about that kind of thing. Trust God for what to say. And we ought to always do that when we're trying to explain our faith is rely on the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, in this passage, in verse 23, he says, when they persecute you in one town, just go to the next. And he goes on to say in verse 26, don't have any fear of them. So this is what the enemy can do. He can try to convince you to sit down and shut up. And the enemy wants to silence the church, this church. If you think about how much power you have, think about how much power we all have together. This church has incredible power. God says, I want you to take a step of faith. I want you to follow me this week and see what God will do. But the enemy is going to try to shut that down. What I want to encourage you to do is go ahead anyway, even if you are afraid. Don't wait until the fear goes away because it may never go away. I got to tell you, I can't explain this, but if I, I, I'm a little afraid to come up here every weekend. Even though I've been doing this now most of my adult life. And I would have thought, and people would say, Mike, well, like, when are you going to grow up? When is that going to go away? I don't think it, maybe it's ever going to go away. Maybe the nerve, I don't know, you come up here and tell me how easy, you know, it, you know, it's just scary, okay? 
But you know what? I do it anyway. I do it for you. I do it for God. So I'm not asking you to do something I don't do four times a week. Okay? You see what I'm saying? Just do what I have to do. And, and do it afraid. Do it scared. Do it anyway. Don't wait for it to go away. And the worst thing will happen is somebody might make fun of you. Just like for me, they might say, he's really not that good of a preacher. That was a bad message, whatever. He's an idiot. I mean, that's like the worst thing that's going to happen, right? Are they going to tease you? It could be worse. So church, what I'm saying is let's toughen up. It could be a lot worse. Wayne Cadero is one of my favorite pastors. He pastors out in Hawaii, in Honolulu, New Hope Church. And he was telling about going to China recently. Uh, this is just like this year. And he was giving a leadership event for 22 Christian leaders. It was, they had to travel, though, it was, and they had to keep it undercover, be underground because it's illegal. They had to travel 13 hours by train. And when they got to the event, they met in a hotel room. It's like 700 square feet with no air conditioning. All 23 of them packed in there together. 18 of them had already been arrested and imprisoned and released at one point in their career, in their ministry. And so he asked them, what happens if we get caught? And they said, well, you'll get deported within 24 hours, but we'll go back to prison for three years. And at, at one point, he asked them to turn to 2 Peter in chapter 1. And as people were turning there, he noticed one woman in the group handed her Bible to someone next to her. But as they were reading that chapter, she was mouthing along. And so he asked her at the break, what was up with that? And she said that she had memorized the whole book of Second Peter in, in, in prison. He said, well, I thought they would have taken the Bibles away. And she said they did. But our visitors would bring us scraps of paper and we would memorize them. Because even though they can take the paper away, they can't take away what's in your heart. And so they ask at the end of this, could you pray for us? that one day we could be free to worship just like you. And Pastor Wayne said, I'm not going to do that, but I will pray that, you'll become, that we will become just like you, that we will have that faith, that we would travel 13 hours, that we would be in a cramped situation for three days without air conditioning, that we would be willing to go to prison for our faith. Listen, there is so much persecution going on, and there's, for some reason, it doesn't make it in, you know, to where you hear about it. I've heard that the, the reason in Britain, they're saying the reason is because of political correctness and because of maybe a colonial past, but nobody's talking about it. But according to the BBC and the British Foreign Secretary, the persecution of Christians in parts of the world is near the United Nations official genocide level. They're estimating, it's hard to get the numbers because people are not reporting that, right, out of North Korea or, or even China. But they estimate somewhere between 4,000 and 100,000 Christians are killed every year for their faith. Now, when I say that, many people will say, well, that's probably combat zone and it's really battling, it's war, those are soldiers. No, that's just a smokescreen. Those are people just like you and I. And they're being killed and imprisoned 4,000 to 100,000 a year, somewhere in there, are killed a year for worshiping and for their faith, for telling other people about Jesus. 1,200 churches, over 1,200 churches are burned worldwide every single year, year over year over year. Christine Kane is another Christian evangelist and activist, and she shared a similar story at the Heaven Come Conference in Los Angeles just this May. She had been in China speaking to 500 Christian leaders in the underground church, and they were saying, we don't understand anything about Christ, you know, Western leadership methods, and so we want you to come and teach us. They said, all we know how to do is to pray and to believe God. We don't even have a Bible oftentimes, so we don't even understand the Bible. And only leadership lessons that we've been able to tell our people is we teach them very specifically how to witness to their executioner on the way to their execution. Now, when Christine heard that, she froze. And she said out loud, what am I doing here? And she literally said, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian. They're asking her to pray for them. And she's like, I'm not even sure I'm a Christian compared to you. I want you to lay hands on me and pray for me and give me the kind of faith that says, I'm going to witness to my executioner 
on the way to my execution. Now, here's my point, church. For us here in America, by comparison, we've got it pretty safe. All it means for us, if we let our light shine, then maybe we'll take some kind of a negative hit. Maybe you'll look like an uncool person or like a kook or some kind of a, you know, seen as a Jesus fanatic or something. But being uncool is not reason enough to put a basket over your light. And that's pride. When I think about what happens in America, it's fear of being not hurt, but fear of being uncool. And that's really pride. And what I'm saying is let's let our light shine even if you're f- afraid, be humble enough to do that. Now listen, I, ex- I, do the, I experience the same thing. Because whenever someone introduces me, I mean, we'll be hanging out, having a good time, whatever, and maybe even, you know, on the lake, on the boat, surfing or something with some people, and someone will say, oh, this is my pastor. You should see the look, that, you know, the, what sh- the, the atmosphere of change on that boat. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, whoa, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, what did I just say? Most people are going back. You can see in their head, their eyes are rolling back. What did I say? Oh, yeah, it was the F-bomb. Yeah, and what else? What else was that? They're starting to count. You almost see them on their How many times did I cuss? And so I, I totally get that. I like to fly, fly below the radar, too. But there is a reason, you know, where maybe that might be appropriate in some situations. But, but I feel like God's even telling me, Mike, let your light shine. And, you know, when I do, when I just be who I am, and uh, that I'm most comfortable myself. I think it's, there's a lot of tension when you try to be someone that you're not. And so let your light shine and use your good works. Jesus said they'll see that through that. In Honduras, we learn to go to villages and find the person of peace. As we, you know, there's like an unofficial mayor, and they won't let you come into their village unless you get permission. And so we get permission to fumigate a home and then set up a temporary one-day health clinic. And then I've been there where we just drive through with a pickup truck and we've got it loaded up with rice and beans and we'll honk the horn. Hundreds of people will come out. We'll just hand out bags and drive off. Then a year later, you do a hot dog supper. And then the next Christmas, you do uh, some shoe boxes. Also, that one day you have the opportunity to tell the story about Jesus Christ. You have to build into all of that. Those are little good works. It just breaks people down. On our first trip to Honduras, where we were actually going in to the villages, they said the next morning we're going to be going to the Mountain of Criminals. Now, that's intimidating, isn't it? We were working with another group from America, and they were talking about the Mountain of Criminals. And the American ladies from another team were talking about it's the most people, so we have to have 1,200 hot dogs. They were unruly when it came time to be served. The kids all have lice, and there's two crazy ladies there. I said, watch out for them. They'll hit you. They'll pinch you. When you see them, run to the truck, jump in the truck, and lock yourself in the truck. And and so they had everybody psyched up like this. So when they got there, sure enough, everything goes wrong. They pull in. The truck gets stuck in the mud. The kids start swarming around all the vehicles. Someone locked the keys inside of one of the trucks. A drunk guy with a machete manages to wander into all of this confusion. The ladies are still trying to tie their hair up in bandanas to keep the lice out. When all of a sudden one of the crazy ladies shows up. And it was only my wife and my daughter who said, you know, they started praying, and they, they just decided they were going to trust God. They went over, they kept her occupied, they helped her to blow bubbles with the children, and she got involved. And she repeatedly started handing them her doll. She hugged them so many times, they thought, we know we're going to get lice out of this situation. And she just followed them around, she never hurt anyone. And that's when they realized the enemy was trying to scare them off. They were trying to keep, the enemy was trying to keep them from telling this village about Jesus Christ. Jesus said that the devil is the father of lies. The subtle message that we receive in all kinds of different ways in our head, in in our experience, is like this crazy lady story. The real crazy ladies were the American ladies, you know, that bought into this whole thing, that put that fear into that group. The biggest weapon the enemy can use is lies, fear, and our pride misconceptions like we think people are not really that interested but people are interested many people are hopeless and discouraged and people today are searching for jesus i believe more than ever the darker it gets the more people are looking have you ever noticed when you're looking on netflix how many specials there are on about biblical archaeology the bible jesus and all this stuff peter it's it's all over the place why people are interested 
And Jesus called that out. He said, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. The, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. The problem is not the harvest. Jesus said, I've got that covered anyway. That's between God and people, right? The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts. That's like God's business. And God tells us the harvest is ripe. The problem, the challenge, he says, is with the workers. So you've got to pray for the workers because there's so much harvest. People are ready. And we, the church, you and I, God's calling us into that harvest. And I want to get you ready for that. You, you look at Ephesians in chapter 6. This is like the chapter that's famous for the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. Why? It goes all the way down to this in verse 19. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel. And this is my prayer that God would give us this kind of attitude that whenever I open my mouth, Lord, you would give me what to say and you would make me fearless. Because church, I believe this is like, I feel like we are setting out on code 2.0 that, that something amazing is about to happen. I really can feel that and tell that. We are going to start reaching people for Christ in an amazing way. So I want to warn you to look out because as God's using us to reach people the, for the kingdom, the enemy is going to notice that. And Satan's going to be throwing everything he can at us. It might be division or disunity or complacency or selfishness. It might be attacks on of health and finances or morality, but get ready because God's going to be doing something. Now, I'm going to get you on your feet right now, and I want us to pray. And if you guys will just give me a few moments, I need you to get out of here as fast as you need to get out of here because we've got to get another group in here, so I get that. What time is it? Somebody tell me what time it is. 10.39? I give you nine extra minutes this week, okay? I'll make it up to you some other time, all right? Let me just... Just trying to, trying to get everybody to chill and to just let me, let me pray for us because we're not closing in prayer, but I want the Holy Spirit to be able to work in our lives. So, Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we pray that you take the Word of God, combine it with the Spirit of God now, and bring about life change for us. Lord, I pray that, I, and I hope, will you just pray with me in your heart and just come along on this prayer and just say, Lord, I accept that I'm the light of the world. It's what Jesus said about you. Now, you need to say it, too. That's agreeing with God. That's really, in a way, it's repentance because what you've been thinking, what you've been living is maybe not that. So you're saying, okay, I am the light of the world, and God's calling me to let my light shine. And really, it shines by nature, but what Jesus says, we put baskets on. What's your basket? And I think for many of us, it's pride. Now, for some, we're just distracted. We're too busy. We've got other things we want to do. Maybe it's a moral basket. You know, you're just out living a sinful lifestyle or whatever. What, so it can be a lot of different baskets. But I think for many people, it's fear. But the fear is a pride fear. I will lose my position. I'll lose my cool factor. I'll lose somebody's confidence. I'll have to explain something I don't understand. And what God's asking of us is, would you take that basket off and just let your light shine? Just, you, I, you don't have to do something crazy. I'm not saying go be a street corner preacher. Be you. But let people see Jesus in you. Let's don't hide our light. No one would do that. Jesus, no one would do that. So God, forgive me for hiding my light. And I want to let it shine. So show me the good works. And right now, I'm relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to show every one of us what that means for us. Good works, that must be able to be a thousand different things. The goodness in us. Would you let that shine through so that people could come to faith in Jesus Christ? For some of you, you just need to let go. You've had some bad negative experiences in the past, and Jesus is saying, shake the dust off your feet. I got that. I'm uncontrolled. Roll on. You need to learn to ride loose in the saddle. So would you have just developed that attitude? I'm not going to take it so seriously because it's ultimately not my responsibility. What's, how somebody reacts. So you've had a bad experience, and I'm saying get back in the game. Will you get back in the game? And just say, Lord, use me. And I'm not going to be afraid of persecution. Lord, Lord, I'm praying now. You said pray for the workers, and I'm praying for them. We know the harvest is plentiful. We can see that all around. There's lost people. They're all desperate. They're all looking. And you've got the whole thing in your hand as far as drawing somebody to repentance. And so what we're praying for, Lord, is as you said, Jesus, we're praying for the workers. 
I'm praying for every person hearing my voice that, Father, you would send them out. We're praying for the harvesters, Lord. Put a passion in our church. Lord, help us get fired up. And I believe you're going to give us experiences and opportunities this weekend to let our light shine and to invite people, especially to Movies at the Cove, to share what God's doing. And Lord, we're just going to be obedient. We're promising that before you right now. Now, let me pray for those of you who don't know Jesus as your Savior. I don't want you to leave without an opportunity to say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. So I'm turning from my life and I'm following you. And if you'll pray that and mean that in your heart, Jesus will come into your life and he'll save you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you.